who are involved in the leadership of the organization of APA to, um, to take judicious action in um, trying to move the profession forward and trying to bring to some degree of resolution some of the damage that had been done to the people, perhaps, um, who uh, might have been tortured as a result of our uh, involvement, um, but importantly to our members and uh, to the public at large and to try to restore confidence um, in our profession in ways that, um, um, that we all feel psychology uh, need to be viewed. Um, I will um, uh, say at the outset that uh, not only did we have um, a board meeting, but we also convened at the American Psychological Association uh, convention in Toronto, a town hall meeting um, on Saturday morning where more than 45 members attended and participated in a, again, a very free-ranging um, conversation and discussion about the implications of this report and about the findings and their accuracy and the like. Um, uh, as well, many of us attended the town hall meeting uh, where thousands, literally thousands of people um, were assembled by Nadine Caslow and by Susan McDaniel, the um, uh, past president and the president-elect of the APA, um, in what I thought was a, a simply tour de force uh, conversation between members and, um, and the leadership of the elected leadership of our organization. Um, other things that we are planning to do in addition to this webinar where we are hoping to listen to uh, um, to the voices of the members here. Um, we are considering possibly having a section of the journal that might be dedicated to issues of ethics and to issues raised by the Hoffman Report. Um, uh, Gail Beck, who is our editor, is um, a premier editor who um, has some thoughts, has some ideas discussed, which I think um, may actually constitute um, an important addition to the academic literature regarding um, the, the problems that have arisen as a result of, uh, of Hoffman and the uh, incidents that led to it. I think um, um, for my personal point of view, um, there are a number of things that need to be addressed and remediated. Um, we are very interested in hearing from you. We had a portal open on our website. Um, we had um, that that was open prior to um, uh, the uh, the APA convention, and we have also requested people to submit written questions, which we have received a large number um, here today, which I think will guide some of the conversation uh, that we have here today. Um, <clears throat> I also um, I, um, I want to say that um, I am very clear um, in my positions that. I do not know what happened um, that led to uh, this um, very uh, disquieting set of events, um, but one of the things that is eminently clear to me is that uh, the membership of the APA needs to run APA, and that even though it is a, an organization of some 600 employees, um, I believe that the model that comes forward from whatever transitions occur as a function of this needs to place much greater reliability on the interests and the input of the members. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to read the report, um, I think you will um, um, also resonate with the notion that the staff was really running things, at least as Hoffman um, uh, depicted it in his review. And that actually resonated very much with my own impressions of how APA has functioned over the years. Um, I do think issues um, such as transparency are critically important. Um, issues of minority opinions are really important. Um, the um, identification of conflicts of interest when they exist um, need to be highlighted. And I think all sides of issues need to be aired in, in the interest of trying to um, promote um, a sound APA that will not revisit this kind of experience once again. And, um, again, for me, um, what most troubling was what appeared to be the sidelining of minority positions um, and the sort of highlighting of the relative important ro importance of roles of staff members in, um, in, in, in trying to move things 
to the next step. And, and, and that, to me, is one of the, I think, prices associated with having an 80,000-plus member organization. I, um, um, I do, I do want to say that I'm absolutely open to uh, trying to provide input into whatever reorganization, whatever resolutions come forward. But I also um, need to convey to the membership that um, the president of any of the divisions, and there are 50 plus divisions in APA, represent only 50% of the membership of APA. And that um, how we interface with APA is not necessarily through the president's or the leadership. It is absolutely through the Council of Representatives. Um, and we have four of them. And I'll just say, um, for those of you interested in communicating with our representatives, they're listed on our website. But uh, Guillermo Bernal from University of Puerto Rico, Mark Sabell from no uh, Nova University, Nova Southeastern, uh, Kenny Shea from um, University of Missouri Columbia, and um, and Danny Wedding from um, uh, American University of Antigua. Um, so these are our four representatives, and they are the ones to carry the buckets of water fo uh, forward in the interest of uh, putting out some of these uh, flaming embers for us. So with, th with this as sort of an opening um, uh, part of the conversation, um, let me ask uh, Dr. Gail Beck to, to just sort of highlight um, some of the things that are most concerning to her and, and perhaps to add to some of the gaps that are left in my opening comments. Thank you, Terry. I think that, you know, this has been a really challenging time for psychology, and it's particularly challenging to recognize that a substantial number of the individuals who were named in the Hoffman Report are clinical psychologists. And so as the Society of Clinical Psychology, I think it really behooves us to step back and think carefully about what role the division has in terms of um, both contributing to repairing APA and, and the structures that broke down within APA, as well as setting a, a different agenda in terms of teaching ethics, um, providing thoughtful essays about uh, new input for the ethics code, for example, um, and being accountable. You know, I mean, I think that no one on this call is certainly a participant in anything that happened that was reported in the Hoffman Report. But I do think as clinical psychologists that we have a role here in terms of um, starting to speak a clear voice in the dialogue about um, structural reorganization within APA um, and the ethics code, because clearly you know, although the ethics code in and of itself wasn't at fault, I think there's probably enough gray areas in the ethics code um, to permit some of the, uh, I don't know, some of the wiggle room that may have opened the door to some of the more egregious errors that were made. So I just think as clinical psychologists, we have a place at the table and in the dialogue. Um, when it comes to the, the ethics part of the transgressions that were made. Um, uh, thank you, Gail. Um, and I do believe you're right about clinical psychology needing to have a leadership role. Many of the divisions are offshoots of SCP Division 12, as uh, most people on the, uh, the phone likely know. Uh, let me uh, just um, ask Dr. Dave Tolan from Institute of Living to uh, give some opening remarks. Dave? Yeah, thanks, Terry. I, to me, I, I think that we need to be thinking about the social psychology of this. I mean, when you look at the facts of this, what you have is, is what may go down in history as one of the greatest ethical breaches in the history of this organization. And my guess is that this will be written about uh, in textbooks in, in generations to come, the same way we read about uh, Milgram and the Stanford Prison. The, the problem that we have is that the people very prominently named in, in this 
uh, in the Hoffman Report are the ethics director of the APA as well as the author of more than one ethics textbook. Therefore, I find it very hard to simply chalk this up to um, the actions of some bad actors. I think that's too easy. I'm, I'm willing to, to believe that the people involved with this are not bad guys. Um, and I do believe that they came in with good intention. Um, but there is something about the systemic pressures and the systemic checks and balances or absences thereof that allowed something like this to absolutely spiral out of control. So, and I, I do know that in some of the, the press releases that APA has put out, they, they wanted this to be uh, about some bad actors. And we had some bad apples in the barrel, and we got rid of them, and so now we're doing better. And I think that that's probably an oversimplification, and we need to look at those systemic factors that would allow something like this to happen. Um, I think that's very wise. Thank you, Dave. And now to uh, Brad Carlin. Um, uh, Brad, do you have some opening thoughts? Thanks, Jerry. I do. So, you know, in my mind, this is a critical juncture for APA, and, and I believe STP specifically. Personally, I felt like there has been a need for change in APA for some time and have a lot of the same concerns and questions many on this call and the broader membership of APA have now. Ironically, when I was first uh, approached about the possibility of running for president at SCP a little over a year ago now, I was not very active in APA in part due to concerns I had about transparency or at least an insider focus. Uh, so the last several months have been especially poignant for me and has um, enhanced the estrangement that many, especially younger psychologists with less experience or involvement in APA um, have felt and those that have not been in the internal networks of APA. Um, so I've been very interested in hearing uh, members' views across a broad range of membership over the last several months. and. One view several SCP members shared at the SCP discussion about the Hoffman Report that we had at convention, which resonated with me, and, and one I had considered to some extent, but felt myself thinking more about since the discussion at convention was that this was a symptom of larger systemic issues. And you know, organizationally, APA has had many vulnerabilities in my mind and poor systems, um, not to criticize, but 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 for the purposes of, of improving upon. So some of those have already been mentioned, um, operations and governments problems, over-reliance on staff and volunteer leaders, um, lack of openness and even dismissiveness of non-insiders, as certainly the recent events have exposed in not truly considering the input of those who have been expressing concerns for years and not including opposing views on the PENS committee. And then to make matters worse, when leaders of the organization had an opportunity to acknowledge failings and show vulnerability, as well as openness and transparency, the response was uh, regrettable, I would say, only reinforcing further the views many have had of the organization. So as disturbing as this has been for me and I think all of us, I, I will say I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm certainly trying to be hopeful that this can be an opportunity for leadership and growth. and if nothing else, it's forced APA to change, albeit long overdue. Um, but it also makes me feel even more strongly about the importance of promoting involvement and in leadership of um, the broad range of membership of SCP, and including, um, for example, younger leaders who may feel even more disconnected and, and disenfranchised. These, these younger psychologists don't have the history of APA's contribution and, and value to uh, shore up their faith and connection to APA. So personally, and, and I think it's fair to say that many others in this call um, are committed to focusing energy on SCP and how we can uh, promote the value um, of membership to a broader range of members as we work our way through the, 
the many larger organizational issues. So I'm looking forward to hearing ideas that people have for this, as well as for making APA uh, an organization in which we're all engaged in and, and feel connected to. So. Uh, Thanks very much, Brad. That was great. Um, and I will say that I also have redoubled my commitment to APA as a function and part of being president this year, but of also seeing what this organization does do for us as psychologists and what it can and should be doing for us and for the public at large. And I think APA is a place where we can make a difference, and I'm looking forward to making the changes that you've highlighted here. Um, there, there is a question, and I'm hoping that Guillermo Bernal is uh, able to take it for us. It's, and uh, one of the questions that was submitted to us earlier, and um, let me say that uh, the chat function on your webinar box, if you've uh, webinared in, um, is a place where you can, in now real time, um, ask questions for us. So please um, do um, try to um, use that function. But we do have a lot of questions here. And, the question for Guillermo is, what is the organization going to do now? What are the steps in council and the board of directors of the APA? What are things that are um, planned uh, to remediate the issues and the problems that have been um, highlighted by Hoffman? Guillermo, are you there? Uh, I am here. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Thank you. Wonderful. OK, I thought I was muted. Um, I think that's the question that all of us have on, on council and at core. I think one first step was, uh, uh, first, I think it's important to acknowledge that the, uh, that the Board of Directors uh, commissioned the Hoffman Report. Um, I am not sure that people really thought, uh, well, this is my hunch, I don't have really have any evidence for this, but it's, it's my hunch that the, the original Notion was that this was kind of, this was like a minor, uh, a minor issue, and the Hoffman report was going to resolve it. And uh, I think no one really anticipated that it had the magnitude that uh, it turned out to be. Um, so of course, um, the immediate things that have been done, uh, as, as we all know, is the uh, dismissal of uh, the director of the ethics office and a couple of other uh, individuals that were involved directly, and the. Uh, resignation of the chief uh, uh, executive officer uh, and the uh, chief um, administrative officer. Um, and then the council passed a major uh, resolution um, uh, on Friday of the APA meeting, uh, essentially banning any participation on, uh, of psychologists in uh, anywhere in the world, in terms of detainees, except, uh, of course, under, um, uh, any, anywhere where there, uh, there is no uh, US jurisdiction, uh, there is a um, prohibition of participating, psychologists participating in, uh, in, uh, in interrogations. So that's, that was like a, a, a first major step. Uh, and that Friday was actually quite, uh, quite contentious, um, mainly, I think, be, because of the uh, level of distrust and uh, certain groups that have been working for a long time uh, to um, um, unmask uh, or bring to light many of the things that came to light through through the uh, through the report. <coughs> now I think the next steps uh, are, are going to be taken at, the, at, our, at our next meeting uh, on council in terms of how to approach and how to bring in some. Uh, um, checks and balances that obviously have not been there uh, in terms of the APA organization. Um, so that I think it's a, uh, I think we have quite a bit of, uh, 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 we can have quite a lot of input into what are the next steps in terms of suggestions um, because we don't have those checks and balances. And I think that's, that's going to be the task for the newly uh, the new board of directors uh, with the uh, recent election that was held um, and with council uh, to, uh, to help guide. The, there is a lot of interest in transparency and I think there's a commitment to transparency. Um, uh, I agree with what uh, Terry has been saying that, uh, that uh, I think the, 
a problem that we have with the organization is that uh, uh, it got professionalized um, and the professionals have been running it and uh, the professional the professionals in the organization have been running it more some more than others um, but I think that has to do from my my sense of it with uh, um, the lack of um, I guess of uh, of supervision um, or certain styles of management, which I think uh, need to change. So, well, I think we have a lot of opportunities in terms of having input at this point uh, and, and making some significant changes in, in the structure of APA. Great. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Guillermo. Um, an, a, another question um, had to do with um, the costs and the expenses associated with this and you know I don't think I'm close enough to um, the estimate of four to five million dollars that the Hoffman report will um, actually um, wind up costing the organization. Um, there were many comments that were made um, from people either in emails or in submissions to the portal about the costs and I, I, I don't think we have the final answers, but um, certainly the numbers that have been bantered about at, at the APA were eye-popping and, um, again, very discouraging. There's so many good things that we might have done with those dollars, and uh, instead we're trying to um, correct or remediate um, problems that probably should never have occurred. Um, uh, exactly how... Um, this panel was selected, or this uh, set of attorneys was selected. Um, you know, these are this is uh, uh, probably of no use in um, in recounting mm -hmm. that and trying to justify it at this point, because it's uh, um, it's already done. Um, there were people. There was one email to me that suggested that you know perhaps these should have been this should have been done by ethicists, and I certainly felt that ethicists might have been better than attorneys. Um, but you know, attorneys have their strengths too, um, and um, and they did do a very intensive, I think, and um, a pretty amazing job of trying to understand a complicated uh, national organization. Mm -hmm. So let, let me, you know, Gail, there was a question that um, I was hoping that perhaps you might have some thoughts as a university faculty member um, about the issue of what might be taught? What what might come from this in terms of trying to communicate to students? Uh, the academic year is starting. I'm sure yours is starting this week or next also. How mm -hmm. might this be taught in graduate programs? What are you thinking? Well, this is in an interesting question in a lot of ways because, you know, we are all, as accredited programs, required to have a certain amount of um, education classes and discussions and the like about ethics and here we have um, sort of a real life living example in our backyard um, and I think that it's an important example in terms of you know if we live by our ethics code and if we understand the principles that underlie our ethics code there are you know certain amounts of um, actions that are required and so you know I think all of us who've been in the field for for any amount of time know that the ethics code has some amount of um, gray areas in it and no matter how many times we revise it there will always be gray areas in the ethics code because things you know situations that challenge our field are so rapidly developing that there's no way that the ethics code at any given time can anticipate um, you know, Guant Guantanamo or um, doing therapy through um, Skype, for example. So, you know, teaching those principles, I think, becomes even more important. And the notion of um, what adherence to the ethics code means, that it means adherence both for yourself and for your peers, and what to do in those moments when you are unsure um, of a circumstance, you know, and that could be, for example, something where there's a potential conflict of interest, um, either on your part or on someone else's part in a group. Um, 
know what to do at those moments. And we, we try very hard to teach our students that if you're in a position where you're not entirely sure what the ethical pathway is, that you, you seek peer supervision, that you try to think it through on your own, and that you reach out and seek peer supervision from individuals who've been in the field perhaps longer than you. So I think this is sort of an interesting and important time educationally to think, teach our students a bit more than, um, you know, go to the specific rules in the ethical code, um, but to also remind them that there are principles that underlie that and that by using those principles, most anyone can sort of figure out what is an ethical step and what isn't. Obviously, you know, some amount of what happened within APA, as David Tolan points out, is really um, a structural issue. Um, maybe, maybe we could call it groupthink if we wanted to. But I don't think that um, we're well served by sort of pushing what happened off to the side as sort of an organizational problem. I think that, you know, we have a great example here of psychologists, some of whom were held in high esteem, who behaved in ways that were totally orthogonal to our code of ethics. And, you know, what do we do going forward when we get into circumstances where the code per se doesn't give us a directive in terms of right and wrong? So it's an it's important time, I think, for teaching. I, I think, too, Gail, I'll just add to your um, points that the, the whole issue of the country being at war, having been attacked in the worst attacks in mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, really needed to fig factor into how people were thinking and feeling at the time that much of this really uh, um, occurred. and. Uh, that, I think, also sort of reminds me of all kinds of past offenses um, made not by the APA, but by, you know, citizens in various countries of this panic mode of thinking and the group think that um, uh, I, I think you and Dave have highlighted here. There, there's a, there's a well, question sure. here. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, this is Dave. I'm sorry. I would just say that as you're sort of mentioning, you know, past offenses, I would say APA has gotten into this in the past. I mean, in uh, World War II, uh, there were publications in APA journals essentially calling on psychologists to use all of their knowledge, all of their skills, to figure out ways to break down the enemy. Um, that that uh, th that was was um, that kind of culminated in the 50s during the Cold War uh, with the, uh, the the ability dependency dread uh, policies that that were developed largely by psychologists. So the idea of of torturing people isn't particularly new to psychology or to the APA. In fact, a, a APA and psychologists have been in the torture business for some time. And this is really when it all hit. Um, I guess one question that, that I would have is, you know, some people have questioned the, the idea of do no harm, which obviously is a, is a medical um, uh, uh, ethical standpoint, but, but we tend to adopt it as part of, as part of our ethics procedures. And some have raised the question of, well, is it okay to harm one person if it prevents harm to a bunch of other people? Uh, my thought is no, but I would be interested in hearing what the other panelists have to say about that. Well, of course, this is an age-old issue um, that uh, certainly rings true and certainly um, public health uh, doctrinaires that have been Sort of seeing, you know, can you restrict one person's um, freedom in the interest of preserving and cultures and countries and people debate and discuss this um, um, at great length? I, I, I don't know that we're going to resolve it, but I do want to be perfectly clear that I, as a clinician, do subscribe to the issue of do no harm, and but I am a clinical psychologist and. 
Um, I think that is uh, something that guides me um, on a daily basis in my interactions uh, with colleagues, with patients, and the like. So th there is actually a question that's up that um, uh, comes from the West Coast, and that is about the actual resolution that was passed. And I'm hoping, Guillermo, that you might be able to um, sort of parse this uh, question for us, uh, for the group. And the question was, um, is it a national security interrogation per se that we are not supposed to participate in, or is it interrogations of any kind that entail torture that we are to exempt sure. ourselves from? That's an excellent question. I, I, I believe that it, uh, the, the way that the resolution was written is to uh, 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 prohibit the participation of, an, of any interrogation uh, that's, uh, that's done uh, in s scenarios or contexts that would not normally be uh, 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 within the framework of the U.S. Constitution. So any uh, uh, psychologist uh, anywhere in the world that's involved in uh, interrogations um, where the U.S. Constitution does not apply, like Guantanamo, like anywhere else, um, would be subject to the, uh, uh, to the prohibition that was passed uh, by APA. Uh, that's my reading of it. And I can look up the, uh, the uh, I think that's uh, pretty accessible uh, in terms of the wording because it was very clear. That was, that was one of the, uh, in fact, um, one of the points that was being made on council about that issue had to do with, well, uh, what happens, um, somebody was bringing up the point of whether um, uh, the um, resolution that was passed was, uh, which was actually uh, adopted international law. Um, what what if it was in contradiction with uh, with U.S. law, with state law or territorial laws? Um, and what was the uh, psychologist to do? Um, and so that was that was an issue that was debated. Uh, uh, but I, but I think uh, my understanding is that it covers really any interrogation, um, any participation in interrogations um, that is not under the uh, um, the auspices of uh, or the uh, umbrella of the U.S. Constitution. And that's 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 the way of uh, ensuring that uh, it's the resolution goes hand in hand with international uh, conventions. Uh, that are accepted by uh, many other nations. Uh, thank you. Um, another question here um, asks, um, um, what should we do about the people who are named in the Hoffman report? Um, should uh, individuals be sanctioned? Um, should they be banned from leadership positions? Um, and um, what kind of pending review um, of their culpability, and I think this is um, a key point. I mean, all we have is what um, Hoffman reported. We do not have, in the main, we do not have um, detailed um, sort of other sides of these stories from uh, many people. There have been brief reports from some of the key people that have come out, and um, as you likely know, most people are um, saying they had no fingerprints on a lot of this or they're accepting small portions of things. But I'm wondering, Brad, if um, you might um, provide some thoughts on what the next steps might be for uh, the people. Obviously, Steve Benke has been terminated and um, we have not heard from Steve um, at this point. Um, and uh, there are a number of other resignations that are either just finished, uh, have just occurred, or will be occurring within a few months' time. But what sh what should happen, Brad? You may be on mute. All right, um, uh, Dave. Do you have any thoughts about this? Brad may have popped off. Yeah, sure. I 
you know, I, I do think that we need to have accountability. I, I think that lack of accountability has been one of the major systemic problems that led to this in the first place. The APA doesn't have a whole lot of things it can do to a person short of, you know, barring them from leadership positions or, or expelling them from APA. Um, but, I, you know, I, I am inclined, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people gripe about the Hoffman report and how it sounds very accusatory and so on. And, you know, I, I would just sort of point out that, that this, is, this is APA's own lawyer. You know, and, and you know, when when your own lawyer puts something together like this, it, it's pretty damning. Even if you try to take out some of the accusatory language and their and Hoffman's um, you know, thoughts about people's motives, if you just simply look at the facts that Hoffman lays out, they're pretty bad. And I, I don't think we can let that stand. Um, while I, I do think that there are systemic issues that we have to address, at the same time, I, I do think there has to be some uh, some accountability at the individual level, and and therefore I would would be in favor of of you know having a, a fair ethical hearing for the individuals that are named. All right, but David, that doesn't necessarily that can't necessarily happen at the division level. Right. I mean, that would have to happen at the association level. That's correct. The, the division is not in a position to do much of anything. So the, the APA would really have to do this. Well, I think the only option available for the division is to decide whether or not um, for those individuals who are named in the report, especially in the most egregious roles, to decide if um, removing their membership from the division would be an appropriate step. And I think that that is, is something that I don't know that the, our leadership has talked about, but I think that that is probably about the only option that's available within Division 12. Yeah. Oh, this is Brad. For some reason, my audio wasn't coming through, so I just had to call back in. <laughs> Um, Thanks a lot. Thanks for. Don't, don't you love it? It's seven seven forty two Eastern time. Um, if my phone's tired. That being said, uh, I, I heard Gail's comments and some of David's comments. You know, for me, I would say that I I feel like I don't have um, a lot of missing information, and it would be um, very helpful to know a little bit more um, about what I don't know. Um, that being said, I do personally think that there needed to be um, some response. I don't know that I feel like uh, I have come to a point where I think that removing division membership would um, necessarily be the appropriate next step, especially without having um, much information. Again, I feel like I have just a fraction of the of the information, who knows what what information that that I'm not privy to. Um, so I would be interested in hearing what what others think in, within the membership as well. Um, ideally, we would have an opportunity to hear more from the individuals we've heard very little from, um, and and of course, everybody I think would like to hear <laughs> directly from Hoffman um, and have a chance to. To ask him questions and engage in a dialogue, but of course, those wishes and fantasies will likely never become a reality. Is is, is there precedent um, for the division taking and and taking action against its members over an ethical issue above and beyond what APA broadly has done? Do we have a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Is there, pre is, there, is there a precedent for us to, as a division, to yes. take action against an individual? You're um, right. I think Has the division I, ever had an ethics hearing and taken a action uh, around yeah. those issues? Yeah. 
Um, I think mm -hmm. having them be Trip is uh, one way in which people could possibly take action if that was something. Um, with, if there were egregious offenses found and confirmed, I mean, I think it could be done. Um, I, I, I think that what the listservs have been sort of buzzing about is whether or not people should be turned over to their state licensing mm. boards, which would be a, um, um, a, a, um, a very powerful statement. And um, uh, But then again, apparently some of uh, the people have been um, sort of brought to various state boards without consequences for reasons that uh, were never that clear to me um, in the report or in the responses from people. So I, yeah, I does, don't have a clear answer. It does seem, though, that there, if, if it were to go to that level or even revoking membership, that some due process would be um, important, which obviously hasn't happened yet. But for the for the actions that have been taken thus far, you know, arguably one could say that um, a full uh, due process uh, components wasn't necessary, but going beyond that, probably due process would be. And I think you were alluding to that, Terry, in your comments. Absolutely was, yeah, absolutely. I am wondering. I'm wondering if um, it looks like we currently have 83 people on this webinar, and I'm wondering if there are questions from any of the folks who are currently on the webinar um, that we might want to address. Um, the chat function, people can um, add um, a question in the chat function on the webinar um, bar, if you'd like. Um, let me just take one of the other questions submitted earlier, um, and we can wait for people to um, uh, to try to chime in here. Yeah. Um, it seems that there uh, is a distinction, uh, an important distinction, between the CIA interrogation program that was contracted to um, uh, to psychologists um, and some of the other people who were mentioned, um, who were sort of military psychologists working in field settings. Um, is there any evidence that the psychologists in the military side of things who originally asked for guidance from the APA actually did abuse prisoners of war? Um, I, am, I am not aware. I, what, I have, what I have read from this, I'll just open by saying what I have read is that there were many assertions that psychologists who were present in the, some of these settings actually either prevented or mitigated the abuse that um, might have otherwise come forward. Um, but I don't think I have any um, hard data uh, to suggest mm -hmm. that uh, it increased or decreased. My hope is that um, the presence of a psychologist would have decreased it, but um, as we all know, the two people who were contracted um, um, came up with some uh, pretty, um, pretty horrific, pretty horrendous um, uh, things that they thought, thought were justifiable. Yeah, and I think, and actually, Terry, I think this is a, um, you know, I think that that idea of psychologists being able to prevent torture is is a very tricky issue and and as many have have noted and written about that actually starts to become a, a loophole because it yeah. plays off of uh, some of the definitions of torture that were developed during the Bush administration um, I, I think many have noted that, that there's not much in a psychologist training that would really allow you to that would that would, would make you know how to prevent torture, or how to permit, how to make sure that an interrogation doesn't go off track, and that actually it, it, it starts to essentially become uh, a fig leaf for for torture that allows it to seem like it's not torture. So I, you know, I'm I'm very wary about this idea of of pathologists in a role of torture preventers. Um, I, I actually think that uh, it is the safest route for us to take. Uh, you know, Terry, in relation to the earlier question concerning the uh, 
um, the interrogations and, and, uh, and the kinds of interrogations. I found the uh, language on the resolution, uh, which I can, and it has, it has a very interesting footnote that uh, I think it should be noted. And the language, is, is, if I can take a second to or a couple of minutes or a minute to read it, says that we had further resolved that in keeping with principle A, beneficence and uh, maleficence of the ethics code to take care of, to do no harm, psychologists shall not conduct supervised being the presence of or otherwise assist any national security interrogations. There is a footnote there, which I'll get to in a minute, for any military or intelligence entities, including private contractors working on their behalf, nor advice on conditions of confinement insofar as these might constitute such interrogations. Another footnote, this prohibition does not apply to domestic law enforcement interrogations or domestic detention settings where delegates are afforded all of the protections of the U.S. Constitution, including the Fifth Amendment rights uh, against self-incrimination, the Miranda rights as well as the Sixth Amendment rights to uh, effective assistance of political counsel. Now, the interesting thing about Footman number five was that for the purpose of this policy statement, national security interrogations refer to the interrogation of any detainee in the custody of any agency or subsidiary agency that reports to the Director of National Intelligence, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of Homeland Security, or the National Security Council, including joint elements such as the High Value Detainee Interrogation Group. This also includes any operations by those agencies with any allied government or non-state actors, including private contractors. This does not include those detainees on the held, again, under domestic law enforcement, whereas they're under rights in U.S. Constitution supply. So, so that's like a pretty wide net in terms yeah. of the, uh, you know, the, the prohibition for uh, participating in interrogations. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they left out any <laughs> anything out of that. Uh, yeah, it seemed airtight to me as well, mm -hmm. Guillermo. Thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm wondering if there are um, any thoughts from our panelists about some of the next steps that um, we might recommend to the leadership of the APA, something that um, uh, that um, could actually result in material changes in the way in which the organization is structured. I'll just by uh, by sort of saying that uh, among the things that uh, um, I would like to see is that, that committees are comprised in ways that actually do um, permit the membership uh, to be involved. And if you read the section of the report, I think it might have been in the, 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 the ending pages about how committees are, um, were selected, the staff had an awful lot to do with uh, who was included. Um, and that may be one of the um, remedial actions that uh, could be taken and, you know, I think with an organization that uh, is in need of re-energizing, I think trying to have, um, you know, uh, students or interns and early career people, scientists, clinicians, clinician scientists, uh, practitioners of all stripes represented um, effectively on these committees and then have somebody review uh, so that whoever, whoever was staffing that committee didn't have the final say in um, the, the selection, the identification of uh, the members of, of a particular committee. And exactly how you do that in an organization this size, I think, is a monumental task. But uh, that's one of the things that I think needs to be done, is that uh, the structure for membership of committees and task forces uh, needs to be reconsidered. Are there any other, um, any other recommendations that um, um, the panel can think of, of, of ways in which the structure can be modified, because I think this is really fundamental to um, um, how we move forward as, an, as a group, as an organization. Well, this, if we think about, about a couple of the factors that really led to, to some of the, the, the errors that we see here. One, I mean, we have, I'm thinking about the PENS committee in particular is that you had a, a closed committee without any transparency and you had uh, and you had that rushed to the board without council being able to do it. 
what would we think, and I'm, I'm asking the panel here, what would we think about putting a ban on both of those issues? That is, no closed committees and, and nothing can, can bypass council. I think um, those are, you know, reasonable things to be considered. I, I do know, Dave, that um, there was a movement under this good governance uh, project that um, that you certainly were following when you were president, and I have been as well, um, to sort of switch the roles, making um, the board, which meets more regularly, more frequently, the opportunity to sort of weigh in quickly, so that uh, in real time, should be um, addressed and managed effectively. That, of course, takes um, the whole democratic feel away from the organization. I think is a big issue and a big problem. I would hard to compete with the dishes there, but um, uh, this is Brad. I, I would say related to that issue, but even more broadly, that I think there is such a need for strong senior leadership in APA and senior leadership that is fairly well involved in various aspects of the organization, organizational structures and systems. And I think no matter how much we may think positively of an individual, um, individuals are human beings and we all know obviously that human beings Oops, a little, a little bit of feedback. That humans have um, their failings, and so we can never rely on an individual in a specific role or overseeing a specific committee. If we put too much faith in that and don't have strong leadership and an appropriate structure, as you say, Terry, then we're going to set ourselves up for failure. I think we've all seen situations maybe not to this level, but where there have been um, failings and there have been major repercussions or where committees have been stacked and so forth. So I think the structure is very important um, and also ensuring that there's strong senior leadership that's going to be quite active in the organization and organizational processes. Uh, Gail, any thoughts about uh, next steps that you can think of? I think it gets kind of challenging because this is a substantial organization with a great many members. And by and large, um, the leadership positions are relatively short term. So for example, in SCP, you're president-elect for a year, you're president for a year, and you're past president forever, but actively for the first year after your presidential year. And I think that the same is true um, about the presidency of APA. So there's sort of an issue of if you have a rotating um, set of individuals who are going through different leadership positions, then who's going to you know who's going to run the shop? And not just in APA and many other organizations, this sort of model has a there's APA staff people that may include professionals the elected part of the leadership. I think that if we're going to have um, an organization that reflects less divisiveness between those two segments, that there has to be some amount of accountancy that happens with the APA staff individuals. And that includes, I think, the professionals that are hired into any kind of key organizational positions. Um, I know that a great amount of what went into the Good Governance um, project was concerning because it seemed to be removing the voice that council had, um, which is, of course, the voice of the membership. Um, so I think that there has to be whereby um, non-elected leaders within APA are, accountant, ha are held accountants to the membership. And that has to obviously be a fairly fast-moving process, given um, the way issues like the, the torture issue came up um, in our past. 
um, thanks very much, Gail. Um, it is uh, the appointed hour. I want to uh, just um, thank Deb Drabik from Temple University for um, organizing and helping um, uh, construct this webinar tonight. Um, I deeply appreciate her efforts uh, to allow us this hour to, um, uh, to speak about um, uh, the issues of Hoffman. Um, I do want to thank all of our panelists and all of our participants also um, for uh, contributing their time, for thinking and listening. And um, I do want to just reiterate um, uh, something that I said in my uh, white paper um, last month, and that is it's, it's, it's really now the time to be active. APA is a very valuable resource for this uh, country, for the people of this country and the world. And it is, a, it is time now for us to really try to take the reins and wrestle them back from um, uh, staffers and to make this a membership-driven organization. Um, I will also just conclude uh, the session by saying that um, this is our profession. This is our organization. And we need to work very hard. We need to redouble our efforts uh, in the interest of trying to make this everything it can, it needs, and it should be. Uh, thank you all. Thanks to the panelists. And um, if there are other issues or questions, please feel free to email me or email any of our people on the panelists. Thanks to Gail, to Brad, to Dave, and to Guillermo. Appreciate it. Good night.